it's so exciting every time to be at Pafau. I've been here, I think, four times now. And I think, um, you know, drawing on what was said earlier this morning with Rob Cross, what uh, Al just said, it's like having 200 energizers around me, right? Everyone I speak to, it gives me more energy to go back and, and try to like push a little bit harder. So super stoked to be here. Uh, and, and thanks for Al. I, you know, he gave that pep talk right before mine. I promise it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you anyway. Um, so a little bit about myself. My name is Gitanjali Gamal, and I lead um, a team that's called Modeling and Insights, which is part of the larger workforce analytics and data strategy and governance team. That's a mouthful. <laughs> At Johnson & Johnson. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you or all of you have heard of Johnson & Johnson. We're well known for our consumer products, but actually we have three lines of business, medical devices, pharma, and consumer um, it's a large organization, about 140,000 employees globally, and my team uh, supports the workforce analytics needs um, across the enterprise globally. So it's a lot of fun challenges that we work with. So today, um, you know, what I wanted to talk about was um, a topic that's really, really close to my heart. It's becoming more and more important to me, and, and I think to, to many of you, um, it's something that I feel like, um, to give you a little bit more background on, on why I've been thinking about this, so I'm an economist by training. Before I came to People Analytics, I had a long career where I was focused on analytics in the business space, so it was all about um, you know, customer growth and how do you sell more of whatever, more units of whatever you were trying to sell, how does that impact revenues, all important things. So that's what I brought with me when I came to the people analytics space. And that served me well, right? Because it's it's important to have that business value angle. But what I came seeking, which I'm glad I found and I'm hoping to push forward, is how do we bring a human angle to this, right? This is about people. This is not about widgets. Um, so how do we make sure that we always have that lens? So with that, I just realized I don't have a clicker. But, oh, no, I do, if it works now. Um, so let's see. Ah, it's working. Great. Um, so this is, you know, one of my favorite quotes. Um, maybe stories are just data with a soul. I, I love this. Um, and, and let me tell you a um, little bit of a story of why. Uh, <laughs> so um, essentially, when I started, like about three years ago, Right. Uh, one of the things that I became very passionate about as I was working was making sure that how do we get uh, good information, good insights into the hands of everyone and not just our analytics teams? And how can that drive better outcomes, better business decisions, uh, better outcomes for employees? And uh, I like to find like a word that can kind of summarize that whole thing. So I always said, I want to democratize, right? I want to democratize data. I want to democratize insights. And I became the butt of joke in my organization, not in a negative way. I mean, they all appreciated what I did, but it was so funny because everyone was like, oh, what's Gitanjali's favorite word? So it was like hashtag democratize. So that was great. But, you know, I, I kind of wore that like a badge of honor. And I was like, OK, you know, you, you say that, but you remember the word and you know what it stands for, right? It's catchy. Um, and, and three years later, being able to do that successfully in that organization is very proud of that work that, that me and my team did. Now, what I'm all about is humanize. And that's something that, that Al has been speaking about earlier as well. And I think that is so important. And that's why I think this quote is so close to my heart, because uh, when we work with a lot of data, as um, many of us here do, we also start realizing that data can be sometimes dehumanizing or in large quantities, uh, you know, frequently it can be desensitizing almost. So how do we make sure that we can be good storytellers so we can actually humanize this information and make people aware of the impact that this work can have for good? Um, and so I think being able to tell good stories as people analytics leaders, I don't think that's just a, a quality that makes you a good people analytics leader. I think it's more than that. It's more fundamental. I feel like it's almost a responsibility that, that we all have. So with that, if you think about the overall environment, right? I think this was, uh, Ian alluded to this a little bit yesterday. Um, if you look at the business roundtable, 
they came out with, with this release about, you know, balancing profits with purpose, like how we need to do more than just thinking about short-term profits or bottom lines, like how do we do more for the world and for the community? So there's definitely the environment is very ripe for, for enabling some of this work. Um, in the middle, what you see there is our credo for j, j This is sort of like our DNA or guiding principle at j, j It's been around for over 75 years, which is amazing that we had such forward-thinking leaders uh, even so many years ago, where you can see that you know, we kind of start out, our first paragraph is about how do we do the right thing for our patients, customers, et cetera. The second is employees. So employees are like way up there. And the last talks about, the last paragraph talks about shareholders. So definitely that's something that really drew me. Um, I think yesterday, I, I think it was Thomas who gave the example of Lululemon. Um, and if you go to J&J, &J, go to any of our facilities, you'll find the same kind of passion around the credo. Like people will tell you how they came to J&J &J because of the credo and how they work every day and how they connect back to that. So that's definitely something that's within our DNA and that really helps me, um, you know, connect my personal purpose with what we're trying to do uh, in people analytics. And, you know, the, the other example here is the Health for Humanity report. If you haven't read this, uh, you know, go for, just just kind of Google it. Um, you'll find some really, really good information about some of the commitments that we've made to social, you know, sustainable um, priorities. And I think this is something that again tells you that the environment right now is where, whether you are part of a community, whether you're part of a big business or a small business, everyone can do their own little bit to make an impact. And I think in people analytics, we have a unique opportunity, so I'll share some things with you here about that. But first, let's talk about the purpose of people analytics, right? Now, this is something, again, very important to me because um, we talk about, like, who's our customer in people analytics, right? Someone says, well, it's our HR team. Some people say, no, 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 it's actually our business leaders. But ultimately, it's also our employees, our colleagues, who we're doing all this work for and who you know, get impacted by this work and through them, larger society does. So I think it's important to think that business value, employee value, and social value are not mutually exclusive. These are all things that we can impact at the same time. And we can find um, ways within the work that we do to be able to make an impact. And, um, you know, one of the things I think in the last three to four years that, that we've heard a lot, and I have said that and kind of, you know, um, worked, worked with that sort of headspace, is making a case for people analytics, right? And like many of us were in that mode of how do you show the value? And by value, we automatically then tie it to how do we show P&L impact? How do we show cost savings or revenue growth? which is great, and I still say that it's very important to be able to show that, but that's not enough. I think we have to show what are we doing in terms of the employee value proposition. You know, what are we giving back? So, there are many paths, right? Many different paths to making a difference. Um, some people have the infrastructure and the ability to engage in large programs. Um, but there are, every single one of us is probably involved in some project or has some opportunity within the work that we're doing to be able to find ways to make a positive impact as long as we take the lens of empathy, which I think is extremely important. If we're thinking compassionately, we're thinking about the people we impact, we're thinking about what the end user will experience, how they will feel, how this will impact their careers, I think we can make a positive difference. And um, one sort of uh, short shout out that I really want to give while I'm, I'm talking about this is um, if you really want to see an example of someone being a force for good using data, using their people analytics background, like the person that immediately comes to my mind is Stella Lupashore. I don't know if Stella's in the room here somewhere, but there she is. Um, but if you haven't spoken to her, like go talk to her about some of the work she's doing with Amazing Community. It's uh, really awesome, and I think it's very, very inspiring. So it's like hashtag goals for me when I see what she does. But, but again, like not, not all of us can go in and you know, necessarily start up an entire program or give a lot of our time, but what we can do within our own um, work environment can also be pretty strong, and I'll show you a few examples of the types of things that we are trying to do. 
So, how many of you, right, as you've been working and getting questions from your business partners or your leaders, have heard things like, well, you know, we don't think we have anyone, I'm gonna make up this skill, right? We don't think we know, have anyone who really knows NLP. Like, we need to hire some people who can do natural language processing. We just, we don't have enough good talent doing that. And, and a lot of times we might not even have that kind of a skill repository where we can quickly look this up. And, and we're like, oh yeah, that's right. We'd probably have to hire this talent because we just don't have it. And then later you find out, oh well, guess what? In another part of the business, there's a whole team that works on it. We just never happened to cross paths, so we didn't know. Now what impact does that have? That has an impact on the business, right? Because now you're going out and hiring someone when you actually had that talent in-house, that has an impact for that talent too, because they could have been connected to an awesome new opportunity, but now, you know, they, they just never even heard about it. And so one of the things that we um, decided that we wanted to spend some time and work, work on is actually working with a um, few data scientists within the organization. We actually went cross-functional here and worked with data scientists from other parts of the organization and created this uh, smart search algorithm in Python. So it was really fun because we got an opportunity to geek out, but at the same time, we knew we were doing something that could create a lot of value. And being able to um, create something where people could type in you know, the skills or the capabilities they were looking for, it would pull from resume data, and be able to match things together and say, here's like a list of people who may have these skills internally. So if you want to reach out to them and see if they can help you with this project or if this is, you know, someone who could be your next candidate for your role, like here's an opportunity to find this talent internally. Again, it's creating business value. It's saving you from going out there and having to like hire externally. It's also creating so much employee value in terms of giving them those opportunities. And that ultimately is what helps you to really dive into creating value for the society is you're creating more opportunities. Now, one thing about this is that we're still working to refine it because as we know, when you're talking about search, you're talking about skills, you know, there's lots of things uh, from the analytics angle to make sure of whether it's, uh, I shouldn't say unbiasing, debiasing <laughs> the algorithm, right? Making sure that you debias the algorithm, making sure that you're trying to find sources of data that are as current as possible, as current resumes as possible. All of those uh, things are very important to pay attention to, so we're definitely working on that. But the idea is that this is not something that took a tremendous amount of effort. This is not something that took resources outside of the resources that we already had in the company. But even within this testing and development phase, it generated so much positive energy just from word of mouth of people within the company who were working on this, spreading the, you know, uh, through word of mouth that this is, this is the work that we're doing. There are opportunities to be had within the company, and that's what we're focusing on. That helps you get the funding to do these kind of things then on a bigger scale, right? So, so here's just one example of that. So another one, right? This is something that I was very, very excited about. So I don't know if all of you um, have heard of Textio, but Textio is a company that um, works in the space of augmented writing. So essentially what they do is they have all these um, machine learning algorithms and using that, they help you understand if you put a job description up, what types of words are you using? Are you using words that are maybe um, keeping women from applying, or they're more likely to get people, um, you know, turned off by some of the words that you're putting in there. And this is really exciting to me because when I went in there, I was like, oh, this is awesome, right? Like we all, like recruiting is such a hard activity and it's such a fragmented activity. Like at j, j we get over a million applicants a year. There's so many people that touch that from recruiters to hiring managers to others. Like this could create so much value, but... <laughs> I also, I obviously thought everybody else can use this help, not me, right? I mean, I can write a good job description, come on. And, and clearly I was wrong. So I went in and I went in to kind of prove to myself that I'm gonna get like a 98 score or something. They got me in the first paragraph. 
<laughs> so it was a good kind of self-awareness exercise. And just to share with you, stakeholder is not a good word. <laughs> I didn't know that. Apparently, it's like the worst corporate cliche. So don't use that in your job descriptions. <laughs> so I was very grateful um, that, that we had this, this sort of technology in there. Again, this is, this is something that's very embedded, right? It's part and parcel of how we're doing business. It's automatically helping our business in terms of opening up our candidate pool, becoming more um, accessible and attractive to people who are diverse in multiple ways. Um, it's, it's helping build our brand, the brand that we want to project. It is projecting our correct brand. So I think it's, it's amazing what it does for the business. It kind of builds the case for itself. But at the same time for employees too, like can you imagine like being someone who's reading a job description thinking, oh, you know, I'm probably not gonna be a good fit and losing out on that opportunity whereas this could open their you know, doors to the future. That's exactly what, what we want to enable. That's what enables that employee value, that social value. And I think, again, this is not a huge project that we had to take up and say, hey, this is our big like data for good initiative. But even in this, just by thinking through how it impacts people, you know, what could be impactful as we're going through our um, talent acquisition process, what can enable some positive value for, for people, for organizations, you can make an impact. And just to show you, there were over 3,000 times that people replaced just in the last year masculine phase, phrases that they were using, um, about 1,000 times feminine phrases and other negative phrases to become more neutral, be more inclusive, and that's what we want to do. So people are clearly using this, they're finding value in it and doing the right thing with it. So again, it's not that hard to do the right thing. It's just about keeping that lens when you're looking for solutions, when you're looking for answers, that how do you incorporate that empathetic or you know, compassionate lens and try to do something. So next, um, I love this picture. So basically, um, if you look at this picture, so right in the middle there, that's our CEO, Alex Gorski, um, to the to the right or your left, that's, <laughs> that's Peter Fasolo, our CHRO. So you can just see from that picture that there is definitely a lot of commitment at Johnson & Johnson to well-being, to health, to sort of a holistic living. Um, and that's something that we have made such a strong commitment to that we actually bought a company called HPI, or Human Performance Institute. If you haven't looked it up, Go Google that. Uh, you'll find some great information there. Uh, with you know the idea that we want to have the healthiest workforce by 2020, so we've actually had this commitment that we have everyone in our company go through this um, amazing program called Energy for Performance or E4P for short. And and it's not just about um, working out, you know, that's that's part of it, but it's about holistic well-being. So well-being goes beyond physical. So there is a physical aspect to it, but there's mental, there's emotional, there's stress management. And uh, I mean, I think, you know, earlier Rob spoke about this, Al spoke about this. How many of us have heard, whether it's through surveys, whether it's through just having conversations over coffee with people, uh, that there is just a great amount of stress, right, in our sort of modern life and in our everyday corporate lives. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of um, overload in every way. And people are trying to balance their work and their life. And um, honestly speaking, there's this whole thing that, well, there's no more work-life balance. There's work-life integration, which kind of adds more stress in some ways. It gives you flexibility, but you're still thinking about work even when you're away from work. So, so with all of that being a reality of our lives, like what can we do as um, you know, as organizations, as HR professionals, as people analytics professionals? And one of the things that we've been working with is who we've been working very closely with our team that leads some of this work around energy for performance. And we've been over time helping them analyze a lot of the data that comes in as people take this program. And it's been amazing because one, that helps us give them information back that kind of strengthens the case for what they're doing, that strengthens um, the story that they can tell people to engage more people to come and participate in this program. Um, and, and we actually found like very clear ties back 
to everything that, that impacts business performance as well as employee performance, right? So we actually did this, um, we actually did this study with about, was it 25,000? I can't, or, yeah, 25, I was gonna say 28. About 25,000 people um, over, you know, over an eight-year period, we looked at people who had participated in the program, uh, you know, like an A-B test and looked at others who hadn't participated in that program. And as we compared outcomes, we actually saw positive outcomes across three um, very specific metrics. So we saw that people who were graduating from this program generally tend, tended to um, outperform those uh, at work than, than ones who hadn't. In terms of retention, they were much more likely to stay with the company over a longer period of time, and they were also more likely to get promoted faster. So again, being able to show that value back to people and to say, as people perform better, as they get promoted, they have more mobility, um, they are retained in the organization, there's positive impact for themselves, for their lives, for their careers, which is also part of well-being, but at the same time, we're also creating value for the business, right? Because if you have better performers who stay longer, who are more engaged, that's going to ultimately impact your business and your outcomes. So again, this is, um, you know, I think we're very fortunate um, at j, j that we have a lot of programs that are geared around well-being, that are geared around um, people's, you know, full lives beyond their lives at work as well that we're able to make those contributions. But I think there are so many, like if you start looking, there, there are so many opportunities in any organization, even if you're doing a retention model, if you have the lens of thinking about, well, what are ways in which we can understand why people are having challenges and how can we provide them some tools to actually overcome those challenges to make their lives better? It's going to have a positive impact for your business. You'll be able to show dollar values, but you'll also be able to ultimately serve, I think, the bigger purpose that, that people analytics has. So with that, the other thing, and this is kind of like the final thought that I wanted to talk about, but with the idea being that hopefully I can come back next time if Al will have me again and talk in more in detail about this work because we've just started scratching the surface and I think there's so much incredible work to be done in this space. Um, so I've been working more and more in the space of employee experience in terms of understanding the holistic experience of our employees and what can we do to make that better? How do we get insights from our data, uh, you know, different ways that we might be looking at our data to really help make the world of work better and, and hopefully extend that to outside of work too because life is so connected in, in every way. And uh, some things that we've found, we've been working very closely with various other teams internally, is that what is really, what really matters to employees can be summed up in, they want to know that I believe, right? That I believe in the mission, I believe in the purpose of what our organization is doing. I want to know that I belong, right? So here's your idea of inclusion, that you have the sense of belonging to this place. And finally, that I matter. And this is so critical because whether it's the work you're doing and how it's getting implemented to drive business objectives, whether it's how much respect you get in terms of people listening to you know what you have to say uh, when you're presenting a thought or you're, you're you know sharing something I think it's so important for people to know that they matter in that grand scheme of things so those are the three sort of like guiding principles um, that that I have towards you know people experience or employee experience that we're taking and with that you know why did we embark on this journey so I think it was really important for us to think about we're not, we don't want to work, you know, get into the field of employee experience just because it's a buzzword, right? Like that's not the point here. The point is, how do we get a better understanding of who our employees are? Like the only way we can be empathetic is we first we have to understand our employees, right? So how do we take an approach towards doing that? How do we understand the way they experience our workplace? That can be many things. That can be everyday processes, right? That can be when you come in. How does your parking situation work to, you know, what is your workplace design like? Um, to how do you feel about going into a discussion with your manager about performance or about coaching? So it's, it's a very large field and we're certainly not going to try and boil the ocean. We'll have to pick, uh, you know, our priorities and start, you know, plugging away with that. But it's really important to understand how people are experiencing that workplace. And then, of course, understanding what makes 
people's experiences difference, different and what makes them similar, right? So if you look at a large population like we have, every individual, individual of course, is different, but there are ways in which you can think about the population where are there groups that have a similar experience because of certain things, um, but are there certain similarities that cut across the entire population and where can we make the most impact? to really make it a better experience for them. So that's something that we are working very hard to try and understand now, and hopefully I can come back to you with more. But I think this will be a major driving force um, for good in our organization, so we're very, very excited about that. And with that, um, you know, one thing that, that we uh, you know, thought of as soon as we started working in this space was, if you think about the world we live in, it's always on, right? We're all used to having all our apps right there with us. Um, and, and what I call sometimes like the Sunday to Monday effect, right? To Sunday, you're connected to everything because, you know, it's all your personal devices and all the apps you want. You come to Monday and you're like, whoa, I went back 20 years and, you know, I'm working with a brick and I don't know what to do. Um, but really, we're, we're working to change that, but more holistically than just through um, technology, I would say. But the idea is that we, um, when we think about customer experience, right, most companies work very hard on providing a great customer experience. I think we have to work even harder on employee experience because employees are making a much bigger commitment to your organization than customers do, right? Customers, the loyalty can switch very easily. Employees are giving you a big chunk of their life. They're giving you um, you know, their, their knowledge, they're giving you a part of themselves. And I think for that, we would definitely have to work harder to make that employee experience not just at par, but actually better even, um, or, you know, spend more time and effort in it than, than we do with customer experience. So that's definitely something that we think will be really critical in, in kind of enabling that wholesome experience and enabling that holistic wellness and, uh, and happiness and that's, that's ultimately you know, the goal there. So with that, I'm going to close with another quote. Um, this, can be, this can be kind of like a controversial one, right? Because this was about when we have all the data online, it'll be great for humanity. Well, depends. Like you should ask the people their views on that. But um, it, it really kind of made me think about we have so much information, so much data at our fingertips now, and it's a choice now for us, like how we want to use it. And if we think with an empathetic lens, I think ethics automatically come into the picture. We can't, you know, we can't approach the data we have, the information we have, it's the power that's at our fingertips without that lens, because I think that's critical in terms of being able to be, um, to make a positive impact, to be, uh, responsible in the way that we're functioning as, as leaders, as professionals, but also as human beings. And I think it's an incredible uh, opportunity that we have right now with, with all the information that we have access to, to do something really impactful and powerful with it. It's, it's up to us how we use it. So just want to leave you with that thought and hopefully we'll come back to share more later. Thank you. Uh, just uh, thank you, Gitanjali. A show yeah. of hands. Who would like to hear Gitanjali come back and tell that story more? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I've heard a lot of preposterous shit lately. That was that was the most crazy stuff I've heard. Of course, <laughs> you're welcome back. That was, that, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have time for one or two questions yeah, for Gitanjali. Sure. I have one. Um, if you don't, is you are very uh, principled in your approach Thank you. and so you uh, can drive this perspective so I know you have your credo yeah and I know you mentioned there's a lot of people who are you know very passionate yeah. about that credo but there's in many organizations that a knowing doing gap okay I know this is what we're about but actually manifesting that you know day to day and bringing data to this for that actually shows this is how we're in fact showing up so my pointed question is you know, where did this um, initiative come from? Did it come from you? Did it come from you know someone on the HR leadership team? And you know, what's the kind of uh, what's the start of all this? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's it's it was pretty organic, right? Because as you mentioned, 
the credo is such a big part. It's 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 almost war cultish about the credo too, yeah. right? So it's it's definitely a big part of how we work. And so everything that we do, the first question is, well, is this is this credo like behavior or not, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that automatically. So when we started talking about, hey, you know, even even things as simple as when people are calling like service centers about us, whatever, right, about a platform. How is that experience? Like automatically, the way that it goes is the next thing we think about. Okay, that's great. We can work on fixing that or call time. But what can we do to really coach people who are answering those calls to be more empathetic and think about what that customer must be going through? Like this might be their third phone call, right? Mm -hmm. Or they might have been moved from one person to another. Or they might be really stressed out because this is about their paycheck. So that automatically comes into being. So I think it wasn't like we had the one um, mandate which said, this is what you must do. It is part of how we work. Um, but yes, definitely our leadership is is very active in the sense that they consciously created an entire people experience organization and said, you know, we, we want to make sure that, that we are thinking about our employees and their full lives and their experience. And we're using data and analytics to drive that. But while we're driving it through data and analytics, it's still about the people. So that human aspect of the story is very important. It's not just to say, hey, we did this, and now it, this is 30% better. That's great. We want to be able to say that. But how did it impact those people? So that, that piece is very important for us. Are you hiring? Can I work for you? <laughs> <laughs> it would yeah. be an honor. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Gitanjali, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Yeah. All right.